All right, given the uh, technical issues we had in class today, because of course I decided to forget my uh, my cable and whatnot, um, I wanted to do a quick recap of the lecture today. Um, I've sort of redone a lot of the computations and whatnot, so I think this recording will go pretty quickly compared to a 50-minute lecture. Um, but I, I thought it was valuable to um, sort of maybe put this again uh, in, a, in a clear, concise fashion. I haven't yet listened to the audio from the recording today, but I'm getting the feeling that it, it didn't come through that clearly, especially because I was walking around and whatnot. Between that and the technical issues that I was having with the um, uh, the instructor station in the room, I just thought it would was best to sort of redo everything. Um, so to go through the announcements, again, uh, we're going to have our first exam Wednesday, September 22nd. Exam review will be the 20th, the Monday before. I will probably start a thread on Teams to uh, curate and collate uh, questions from the class about the, uh, the exam, and that way we can go through them together in class. I mean, of course, while we're there in class, if you have questions, please, you know, um, make sure that you're asking them and whatnot. But um, I thought that if there's some any common questions, that it would give you the opportunity to uh, ask them. Uh, on Friday, uh, September 17th, we have an online lecture uh, where we're going to be discussing cross products of vectors. I've actually already recorded that. I recorded that uh, a little while ago. It's a little mathy. Uh, it's a little, uh, uh, there, there, there's a derivation that goes uh, into the, uh, uh, the lecture that, um, you know, there's a lot of algebra uh, involved. Um, but I think it's the perfect example to pre-record or the perfect lecture to pre-record um, because the actual mechanics of doing a cross product are pretty straightforward. So I thought, let, if we're going to do one, let's do that one. Um, so, oh, and the typo in the lecture seven slides has been fixed. Uh, so between that and what I mentioned uh, in class regarding the uh, issues with the textbook versions and people doing the, uh, uh, the homework out of version 11 as opposed to version 12. Um, I think that we're going to be uh, good to go from here. So let's continue our discussion on um, on static equilibrium in two dimensions. So just recall that um, what we're basically doing is computing resultants and setting those resultants equal to zero and solving for unknowns. That's, that's basically what we're doing. So the uh, concept of static equilibrium for a... Um, particle system for forces all meeting at a common point is that the sum of forces uh, has to equal zero. And so in two dimensions that uh, splits up into sum of forces in the x direction, sum of forces in the y direction has to be equal to zero. So on Monday when we do 3D we're going to have three systems. Um, now actually on Monday what we're going to do is just look at um, describing forces in 3D and then Wednesday we're actually going to worry about solving the system. So we're not going to worry about that uh, now. Uh, don't forget acceleration due to gravity. There's probably going to be some problems show up where we need to account for that. Now, what we were doing in class and what we spent most of the class uh, working on was this example. And this is where we had a lot of those technical issues and whatnot with the um, uh, 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 screen that we were using or that I was using on the lecture station. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to redo this. I thought it would uh, make more sense and we can go through the problem a bit more systematically. So the, there were two points I really wanted to make with this example. Um, the first is that uh, even though there are more forces, so we had three forces in example one, and now we have four in this, in, in this example, it really doesn't matter uh, how many forces you have. If you have two unknowns for a two-dimensional system, you could have 100 billion forces and it wouldn't matter, and you would still solve the problem in the same fashion. Take each force, Describe it in IJ notation, sum up the I components, sum up the J components, set those uh, sums equal to zero, and solve for your unknowns. That's it in a nutshell. I will admit where it gets interesting is when you have more unknowns than you have equations of static equilibrium. So, for instance, if there were three unknowns and only two equations of static equilibrium, we have a name for that. We call that an indeterminate system. Uh, and you can't solve that system with statics alone. Uh, in order to solve that system, you have to use other methods. You have to use methods in mechanics of materials and some other structural analysis uh, methods, but it's 
it's also outside of the scope of this class. I will never ask you a problem in this class where there are more unknowns than there are equations of equilibrium. That will always match. So that, that'll never happen. Um, let's go to our course notebook. Um, right here. So I have also redone the calculations. I just, it probably wasn't all that necessary, but I thought let's clean everything up make sure everything flows, uh, and then we can go through this pretty systematically. So in this problem, we've been given two um, known forces on this uh, point, and we need to determine the two remaining unknowns. So we have a boat that is tethered uh, in a river connected by three cables. We know the tension force in two of the cables, and what we want to determine is the tensile force in the remaining cable as well as the drag force uh, exerted on the hull. And the idea is, again, that the boat is in static equilibrium. It would be in place. So I did this problem in a little bit of a different order than we did in class, I just, but I don't think it really matters. The first thing I did was the trig. Um, it seems that if there's any barriers to this course, it's not statics. It's always the, the, just the, the math, the trig, stuff like that. So let's do that first. So the first thing I did is... Let's just compute this alpha and beta uh, angle directly. Let's just do that first. And so I'm using inverse tangents, just like we did in class. So alpha is the inverse tangent of seven over four, or seven feet over four feet, and beta is the inverse tangent of one and a half over four. Now remember, and this is just a preference for me, um, I always like all of my angles expressed with respect to the horizontal because if you do that, then you can always associate cosines with the x component, sines with the y component. I just think it's a lot easier to remember, remember the formulas. You could use the alpha and beta angles directly, but you'd have to swap your sine, uh, your sines and cosines. And I just think that's a lot harder to remember, but that's me. As long as you get the right vector at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Uh, drop my pen. It doesn't really matter um, what... Um, you know, what angle you use or what trig function that you use. What matters is that the vector description is correct. That's what matters. Now, in terms of our magnitudes, we know that the magnitude of TAB and TAE are 40 pounds and 60 pounds respectively. What we don't know is the magnitude of the third cable and the drag force. So I thought it was kind of beneficial to just put this here. I thought that was, that was uh, valuable to just describe that. Now, I'm gonna scroll down for a bit. Uh, I've got a lot going on here. What I've got is, first off, oh, I uh, added another page by accident. I'll delete that in a sec. So um, first off, what I have is the free body diagram. And I did a couple things a little differently than I did in class today. The first thing I did is I used a different color scheme. I used red for all of the forces that I know and blue for all the forces that I don't know. I don't think that really matters. I just wanted to differentiate between the two, especially since there's a lot of forces going on in this problem. And then I placed the angles with respect to the horizontal right there on the free body diagram. So for instance, for TAB, I know that cosine of 29.74 degrees is associated with the I component and the sine of that angle is associated with respect to the J component. Um, make sure and include the magnitude. Now with TAB, we know the magnitude, it's 40 pounds. So I can compute the magnitude of that vector very easily. Uh, uh, sorry, not the magnitude, but I can compute the components very easily. For TAC, uh, I don't know the magnitude, so I have to leave that TAC term there. And likewise with FD, it's just FD times I and zero J. Now, the first point, as I said in the beginning, the first point I was making in this problem was that just because there's more vectors doesn't mean it's a different process. You're still going to describe your vectors in IJ format. You're going to um, uh, sum up your X components, sum up your Y components, and solve. The second point I wanted to make with this example is you do not need to break out the matrix solver for every problem. With this problem, if we focus on our Y components first, let me do this. I know that's a little ugly, but it makes the point. 
those are the Y components. And if you look at those Y components, there is only one unknown. So that's TAC. So if we're smart, if we're strategic, what we'll do is we'll sum forces in the Y direction first, get a value, and then plug that value into the summation of forces in the X direction. This is not matrix algebra to solve the system. This is substitution. Um, there are many times later on, particularly when we're looking at rigid bodies and reactions and rigid body equilibrium, where instead of dealing with a three by three system or a six by six system, we will be strategic in what order we deal with the equations first because it will make our life easier than breaking out the matrix solver. So we sum forces in the Y direction first and we get a tensile force in cable AC of 42.88 pounds. Then what we do is we sum forces in the X direction. And you can see, I, I wrote that in red because when you write out the uh, terms in the X direction, we already know that TAC. So we plug that in, solve, and here's our two forces. And again, the class notebook's available to everybody in the class. You should be able to follow along with this between what we did in class and this. I think it should be pretty straightforward. Okay. Now, to continue the discussion of pulley problems, um, this is a very common problem that you get on the FE exam. It's a common problem just trying to conceptualize statics is just making sure that you understand the distribution of uh, tensile forces uh, in a 2D system. We can idealize this also as a particle statics problem because we can assume all of the cables all go through a common point. Like we can assume the uh, width of the pulley is negligible. And that's kind of important for the homework hint that I have in the next video. So um, the big thing, the secret with pulley problems is to recognize that the tension is constant throughout the cable. And the other thing that's uh, valuable is our secret weapon. And I mentioned this in class today. Um, I, I have a, a, a running joke that the secret weapon of uh, structural engineering, although it's true with engineering in general, is a samurai sword or a lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan. Because one of the valuable tools at our disposal is the ability to cut a section. Um, when you cut a section, what you're doing is, and I use the example in class that if I'm sitting on top of a table and somebody comes in and chops the table in half next to me, I'm going to fall down. And the reason I'm going to fall down is because there are internal forces inside the table that are keeping me upright. Okay, those um, internal forces are sometimes what we're interested in, not just the external forces on the structure, but the internal forces uh, that the structure is, is supporting. Uh, as engineers who are interested ultimately in design, it is those internal forces that we are sizing beams and columns and gears and pacemakers and what have you. We need to know those internal forces as well. And that is something we will do throughout this semester later on. But the idea of cutting a section is incredibly, incredibly important. When you look at some of these uh, uh, examples that you see here on the, uh, on the slide, for instance, if I were to samurai sword or lightsaber through this example on the left, I would be cutting through two ropes. So if this was 600 pounds, then T would be 300 pounds. Whereas, and let's just keep the box the same weight. With this, the tensile force would be 200 pounds. Because they're, think, it all goes back to static equilibrium. Sum of forces in the Y direction equals zero. Whenever we say sum of forces in the y direction equals zero, it's just another way of saying that everything going up, every force going up has to equal every force going down. So if I have 600 pounds going down, I have to have 600 pounds going up. And if I have three T going up, then T is 200 pounds. And so you do have a couple of homework problems where I've just given you some pulley scenarios and you are to determine what is the tensile force inside the, the rope in order to keep the structure in equilibrium. And I'm actually going to stop there with this video because the next video is where I covered this and go through the, uh, the homework. And I actually recorded these videos in the opposite order. I recorded this one after the, uh, the hint video. But 
doesn't matter. I can just upload them in the right order and put them on the playlist. The magic of YouTube. That's all I have, everybody. You all have a wonderful weekend. I will see you all on Monday.